are the blessings of the Almighty. So I would hereby request our honorary dignitaries to please come forward and light the lamps. Dr. Durga Ji Rao, co-founder and medical director at OSS Fertility. Dr. Krishna Jaitanya, scientific head and clinical embryologist at OSS Fertility. Dr. Rajeshwari, clinical head and fertility specialist OSS Banshankri. Dr. Meghna, clinical head and fertility specialist at OSS HSR. Mr. Sudhakar Jadhav, the chief operating officer at OSS. And Mr. Sudhir Pai, senior advisor, OSS Fertility. Good evening, everybody. We thought uh, we'd pick on something which possibly most of us uh, encounter in our daily practice. And that is unexplained infertility. And the reason why we wanted to speak about this is it's always a very difficult question to answer a couple when they're sitting in front of you with all the reports and we say, okay, this is normal, this is normal. See, when and ask, everything is normal. And then the question they ask is, then why am I not getting pregnant? So just to throw some light on this particular topic, because you know when we say that the sperm count is less or ovulation is not happening, then it's easier for us to explain to them, this is the problem and this is what we are planning to do for you. But if we tell them that everything is normal, then the first question is, what next? Why am I not conceiving and how are you going to help us in this? So when we are talking about unexplained infertility, when will we call a couple unexplained? It's when they have at least one patent fallopian tube and there has to be a documentation of ovulation. And the reason why I'm uh, stressing on the fact that documentation of ovulation is important is because even though women have regular periods, we assume that if a woman has regular periods, then she must be ovulating. Well, that was the old concept. And now what we have realized is at least 25% of women, even with regular periods, may not be ovulating. So that is the reason why documentation of ovulation is extremely important, either in terms of a luteal progesterone or if you're doing serial scans, you're seeing a follicle and a rupture of that follicle. Third most important thing is a semen analysis, which gives you a report of an adequate number of motile sperm. Now, these two factors are extremely important. That is the count as well as the motility. And you cannot judge just because the count is good and if the motility is low that, you know, it's fine and they can go ahead and try naturally. Or even if the motility is good and if the sperm count is low, even that doesn't work. We are supposed to have both of them in terms of the total motile sperm count. So when we are really looking at a sperm analysis report, it's very important for us to know what the total motile sperm count is because the success of unexplained infertility, when we are talking about management, the primary factor is that one particular assessment. But we spoke about three criterias to call a couple unexplained. And that is what the textbooks are telling you. But what we have to do is read between the lines. And as a practicing clinician, we cannot just look at those three factors and ignore other more important factors. And what are they? If you really look at this definition, we are not talking about ovarian reserve at all. We are not talking about the age of the woman. And we are also not talking about the duration of infertility. So the definition that the textbooks are actually telling you is partly incomplete. Because unless you take these three factors into account, we cannot plan a management plan for these women. And management actually depends on these three factors. Why are we stressing on ovarian reserve? The reason why we are stressing on ovarian reserve, and one of the markers for ovarian reserve being AMH, is that as age progressive, we all know that AMH decreases. And if you really look, look at the drastic change that you see from 25 to 30 years onwards. And if you're really looking at per year decrease in your AMH, it's as much as 5.5% with every year of a woman once she crosses 25. So this rapid decline in our ovarian reserve obviously has to be taken into account when we are talking about a management plan. What about age? Why did we also say about not just the ovarian reserve, but also about age? Not just about the fact that ovarian reserve obviously decreases with age. When you're really looking at statistics, cumulative pregnancy rate over two years, if a woman is young than 35, it's as high as 72%. But if she crosses 35, that 72% comes down to 45%. And not just about the impact of age, there's also a decline with the duration of infertility. 
So if a couple are having unprotected intercourse, penetration is happening, she's ovulating, the sperm count is good, but if they still haven't conceived, after five years of cohabitation, there's a further decline of 30% in terms of their chances of pregnancy. Now, the most you know, common thing that we hear doctors say is that it's unexplained, let's go ahead and do a laparoscopy. Again, when we spoke about the definition of unexplained infertility, did we even speak about a pelvic cavity evaluation? We did not. So in the absence of any evidence of tubal or other pelvic pathology, now, how did you assess tubal patency? We look at less invasive investigations like HSG or SIS. Therefore, laparoscopy is actually not warranted in the diagnostic workup of infertility. So this is one point which we need to stress is there is no reason for us to go directly for a laparoscopy even without looking at the management of a unexplained infertility. So when we are talking about management, what is it that we have to look at? We are not talking about ovulation induction. And this is where we have to understand the difference between ovulation induction and controlled ovarian stimulation. Ovulation induction is for people who are not ovulating. These are the women who are anovulatory and therefore you have to go ahead with ovulation induction in them. But these women by the definition of unexplained are actually ovulating. So you're not actually going to be inducing ovulation. You're what you're actually trying to do or what we should be doing is controlled ovarian stimulation. Now the options that we have are expectant management, ovarian stimulation with timed intercourse or a natural cycle IUI, ovarian stimulation with IUI or IVF. Now let's look at the differences between these management. What studies have told us is that if you just give a prescription of a Clomid or a letrozole, and ask them to try naturally, frankly, you're not doing any better than expectant management. So when we are talking about unexplained infertility, unless this particular reason, you rather not give them clomid or letrozole, but ask them to try naturally, expectantly for a few months. What do we mean by expectant management? We all know that our lifestyles are obviously hugely impactful. Prolonged sitting for the people who are in the IT sector, our sleeping uh, timings and postures, tight underwears, saunas, hot tub use, extended periods of driving, occupational exposure, all of these are actually contributing to uh, subfertility as we know it. And that is the reason why the number of couples with subfertility is also increasing. And if you really look at this particular slide, which tells you about the impact of the different lifestyle factors, Obesity, it increases your time to conception by twofold. Underweight, it has more impact, and that is fourfold in terms of time to conception. Smoking, your risk is increased by 60% of infertility. Alcohol, the, it's also increased by 60%, but alcohol, we are not asking them to become teetotalers. Smoking, completely stop. There is no question about, you know, a one cigarette a day or anything. It has to completely stop. Even passive smoking, as we know it, has an impact on fertility. When we are talking about alcohol, at least one or two units a week is still permissible. When we're talking about caffeine, now this is, again, uh, a lot of uh, rejoinders and a lot of, uh, you know, discussion on this. But as we know it, two cups of coffee in a day is still permissible, but not more than that. Obviously, any drug usage uh, is not to be encouraged. And our exposure to toxins or solvents increases your fertility by 40%. So the first step that we have to tell a couple is obviously the weight. And what we are saying is even 5 to 10% of reduction in your weight, we don't have to bring them from a BMI of 35 down to 28 even a 5 to 10% of weight loss is enough to actually improve their chances of fertility. And it improves your hyperandrogenism, insulin resistance, and various other hormonal imbalances. So now, since we have decided that, you know, if you have given them expectant management, and after a period of six months or one year of expectant management, they come back to you still not pregnant, that's when you have to go towards the concept of ovarian stimulation. 
Why did we say ovarian stimulation, not ovulation induction? Is because ovarian stimulation means we have to increase the number of oocytes that the woman is producing. She is producing one anyway without any of our help. So you giving her drugs and making her produce that same one follicle is not going to increase her chances. So you have to plan your management in such a way, your stimulation protocols in such a way that she increases more than one oocyte or releases more than one oocyte during your treatment cycle. And that way you're also correcting any kind of subtle ovulatory dysfunction which sometimes can be connoted to clomiphene. We're also trying to improve implantation through hormonal effects on the endometrium. Now, why did we go directly for ovarian stimulation? Why did we say, you know, why don't you try IUI, natural IUI or Clomid IUI? The reason is because even if you are doing expectant management or you're giving Clomid or you're doing just IUI, if you really look, the live birth rates remain the same. So if you do nothing or if you give Clomid, or if you do a natural cycle IUI, the success rates remain the same. In fact, we are making them spend more money than actually increasing their chances. So ovarian stimulation plus IUI is therefore better than either ovarian stimulation only or a natural cycle IUI. So bottom line, you have to combine the two, ovarian stimulation plus IUI to get a better chance of pregnancy. Now, here are certain figures. If you give Clomid and you do IUI, three cycles, the chances are 31% against an expected management of 9%. Clomid or Letrozole gives you the same success rate when combined with IUI. But if you were to use gonadotropins for your IUI, you're actually making it 32% versus Clomid IUI. So if we were to compare Clomid letrozole versus gonadotropin only IUI, gonadotropin IUI is much better. But let's look at the negatives as well. Everything positive also has a certain negative. Well, the advantages of gonadotropins is obviously, like we said, the highly efficient. Ovulation rate is more than 95% per cycle and conception rate is 20 to 30% per ovulatory cycle. But the limitations here are obviously with gonadotropins come multiple follicles, therefore you have a higher chance of multiple pregnancy. Twins are 25%, thankfully higher order than uh, twins is much lesser at 5%. But another risk, and frankly when we're talking about fertility uh, treatments, we have to remember that the woman is coming to us absolutely healthy. You should not bring her down to a position in which you are making her ill because of your treatments. And the risks of fertility treatments as of now is OHSS. The second thing is obviously multiple pregnancy. For us, multiple pregnancy is still a failure of fertility treatments. We intend to send home a woman healthy with one healthy child. So OHSS is a risk with gonadotropins, which we have to take care of. And obviously, when we are giving gonadotropins, we have to be very careful in terms of the monitoring so that we don't overdo it and cause risk of OHSS and obviously expensive as well. Now, the concept of tubal flushing, you know, olden days, all our professors used to say, do HSG, this woman will conceive within two or three months. Why? They used to say that because any HSG that used to use lipiodol or oil contrast media that actually enhanced the chances of pregnancy, ovulation, and implantation. And in fact, we have come a full circle. And in recent times, we have also heard the same thing that studies have been done in which if you flush the whole uterine cavity and the tubes with oil contrast media, you tend to have better pregnancy rates with an IUI than without or even a water contrast medium. But the only problem with all contrast medium is that once you open a bottle, which costs around 30,000 rupees, once you open a bottle, you cannot use it beyond that day. And you'll have to line up women, you know, all in one day, at least five or six to utilize that 30,000 uh, rupees bottle. So that is not something with the radiologists are really very keen on doing. Now, again, like we said about the uh, oil contrast media, there have also been studies which have said that forget oil contrast media because there's also the concern of oil granulomas if you have a bit of the oil contrast in a peritoneum. Then they looked at different agents and what they found is that even a little flush of lidocaine 
the most commonly used uh, you know anesthetic if you do a flush even with lidocaine there is a small and you know we are very careful in saying that it's non significant but there's a slight higher chance in terms of pregnancy with it now we also spoke about the fact that you know we are looking at ovarian stimulation and not ovulation induction ovarian stimulation being that we want more than one follicle now this actually describes why we are aiming for that if you have only one follicle your chances are similar to a natural chance which is 5.7% if you have two follicles developing your chances increase to 13.6% if you have three follicles there's a slightly higher chance of 16 but if you go beyond 4 again you notice that the chances are falling in fact we should not look at anything beyond 3 3 should be the cut off anything beyond 3 means that we have to cancel the cycle and advise the woman not to have intercourse or definitely not go for iui now the stimulation protocol as we have seen and this is just another reminder is a natural cycle iui doesn't give you better chance than an expectant management which is between 3 to 5% if you add clomid and you do iui it's around 10% if you add gonadotropins to clomid it's around 13% but if you add somewhere in terms of just a purely gonadotropic iui your chances reach almost 20% now another question which always confounds everybody is when should we do iui There are certain people who do IUI when the follicle is ruptured. They first confirm whether the follicle has ruptured and then do IUI. Whereas some people say we should do it somewhere around thirty-four to forty hours and go ahead and do it even without confirming ovulation. So what has study said is that it doesn't matter when you're doing IUI. Anything from twenty-four to forty hours, you can do your IUI, and it doesn't make a difference in terms of your success rates. Now the most you know proficient question that all of us have is how many iuis should be advised because what normally tends to happen these with these uh, fertility couples is they'll go to one doc they will get two or three cycles done doesn't work they go to the next neighbor they go there and they start afresh some people are very honest and tell you that they've had treatment some people may not be honest and not tell you about the treatment so the second doc again restarts the whole cycle again makes them do another two three cycles and this process goes on and on and on and sometimes as fertility specialists even we feel that oh she's only 26 only 27 let's do two more maybe you know this time it will click so we also get greedy because we don't want to increase obviously the cost of the treatments for them and they themselves feel that like you know try to do it in something that is much more manageable in terms of finances so we get lured by this concept and we keep doing treatments but ultimately we are not doing them any favors and when you really look at this your chances of pregnancy with iui increases up to 3 cycles up to 4 cycles and after that it plateaus therefore going anywhere beyond four cycles has to be questioned now this was an extremely good trial which actually gave us some kind of an idea as to what we should be looking at and this was a trial which was called the fast trial and this was done in women who were less than 39 and what they did was they divided them into two groups in the first group they gave them clomid did iui for three cycles it didn't work then they moved on to fsh the gonadotropins plus iui for another 3 cycles and if they didn't conceive after 6 months then they moved them to ivf this group versus another group in which clomid iui they did 3 cycles they didn't conceive they directly took them to ivf so in the first one they waited for 6 months before they took them to ivf in the second one they waited for 3 months before they took them to ivf the time to pregnancy if you really look was 11 months which is almost a year versus 8 months and when they found and they looked at the economic uh, possibilities of both of these options they found that after three cycles of iui with just clomid which is obviously a cheaper treatment than gonadotropins if they didn't conceive going straight for ivf in fact made your whole treatment time to pregnancy and the effort it took you to conceive much cheaper this was a trial now that was somebody who was younger than 39 what do we do when we have older women somebody who's more than 38 years here they found that when you're looking at the cumulative pregnancy rates per couple the first two cycles of iui which is either with clomid or with gonadotropins or immediate ivf if you look at this older group 
They found that whether you did Clomid or gonadotropin IUI, your success rate was only somewhere close to around 15 to 20%. But you have actually went up to 50% if you went directly with IVF. Now, the, another question that, you know, obviously couples ask us is, you have given us medication, you have seen that we have ovulated, you say that the sperm count and the motility was fine, you did the insemination, we followed all the instructions, but we still haven't conceived. That's an extremely common, you know, question that we have. So we have to now tell them that there are quite a few unknowns in IUI. What are the unknowns? Even though we are doing an IUI, we have to be sure that the total motile sperm count, like I said, when you're looking at the sperm analysis report, you have to ensure that it's more than 10 million. If it's less than 10 million, your chances of conception with IUI is decreased. Another thing which a sperm analysis report doesn't tell you is the sperm survival. It just tells you about the movement at that point in time. But that point in time when we are inserting it into a woman's uterus doesn't tell you whether it is going to fertilize an oocyte. So you have to have at least a 24-hour sperm survival of more than 70%. Your no normal spermatozoa should be more than 4%. If you have an insemination of motile count of less than 1 million, no way is IUI going to work. These last two points are particularly for us. Because as busy practitioners, if you're seeing your OPD and then you have your, uh, you know, embryologists say that, you know, the sperm, the sample is ready. And if it takes you longer to actually do the insemination and here delay in IUI from 90 minutes to two hours is definitely going to reduce your chances of conception. Another thing is even the sperm processing from the time that the sperm has been given to the andrologist to the preparation should not be more than 30 to 45 minutes. So these two factors are something which we are in control of and we have to ensure that we are not overlooking these factors. What about the other causes of IUI failure, oocyte quality? Frankly, we are only seeing a collapse of a follicle. If at all you're doing a scan to see whether she's ovulated. We don't know whether there is an oocyte in that particular follicle because when we do IVF, not every follicle has an oocyte. Second aspect is we really definitely don't know the quality. Sperm quality, as we said, we don't know about the acrosome reaction, the zona penetration, or the other factors that we spoke about. We also don't know the tubal ciliary motility. And this is something even a HSG doesn't tell you, even a SIS doesn't tell you. Only if you do a phalloposcopy can you see that there's cilia, and with the movement of the fluid, you can see the movement. Only then you are able to say whether there's any tubal ciliary motility. We don't know whether there's any fertilization happening. We don't know about any implantation. We definitely don't know about any ploidy. So there are so many factors which are unknown. Even in the best of hands, IUI success rate doesn't, at the cumulative pregnancy rate, doesn't cross 30-35% because there are so many things that we really don't control. So what are the things that you would do after an IUI failure? You have done two or three cycles. They haven't conceived everything, you have ticked all the boxes, everything is perfect. So what would you do to this couple to enhance their chances? The first thing is sperm function test. Why? Because like we said, in a routine semen analysis, it does not give you a prediction of fertility. Morphology is poorly correlated with outcomes. Specific sperm dysfunction like the acrosome reaction or the zona binding is not evaluated in a sperm analysis. And again, lab to lab, there's always a difference. You get them to do it in your lab, in a fertility clinic, we will say 10 million. He goes outside to another diagnostic center who's done by a technician who's not very trained. He will give you a 50 million. So he comes back and says, you are doing this so that you, we can go for treatment with you. There's always this variation that you have in lab. That's because of the question of the person who's actually reading the slide. This is very, this is not technician dependent unless you do CASA. You know, it's more what you're seeing and what you're evaluating. Day-to-day -day variability also in terms of the man, in terms of his semen analysis. So sperm function tests were developed to detect abnormalities in terms of the survival, transport in the female genital tract, different steps of fertilization, prediction of fertilization and pregnancy rate, prediction, suggest targeted therapy to reverse infertility. So sometimes if you see that you have a good count, but the motility is slower after 24 hours, then you might suggest going for a double IUI if they are still suitable for further treatments of IUI. What is the place of laparoscopy in failed IUI? So we said for a diagnosis, you don't need laparoscopy. 
but we are not saying that you don't need laparoscopy if they failed in your treatment schedule. So this is where laparoscopy is interjected in terms of your treatments. Why? Because it's both diagnostic and therapeutic, and you can simultaneously evaluate the endometrial cavity as well. And what we have noticed is that when after two or three failed cycles of IUI, if you do a laparoscopy, and if you find mild endometriosis, and if you treat mild endometriosis, the question is not just about labeling them. The question is when you have detected mild endometriosis, you have to treat it. If you are treating it only then, does it become a therapeutic laparoscopic procedure in which even a woman after that has much higher chances of pregnancy even with expectant management. In fact, in endometriosis, the only treatment that makes a difference laparoscopically is mild. The severe endometriosis, your surgery does not make a difference in terms of their live birth. So this was a prospective study to evaluate the role of laparohysteroscopy in unexplained infertility. And what they found is that in laparoscopy, at least 30 to 35% of women, you actually found a pathology. And at least less than 10% of them had an intracavitary lesion, which was not picked up by your ultrasound. So if IUI fails, then what is it that we need to do? We then come to IVF. In IVF, why is it that we as a developing nation, I'm not talking about the uh, European countries in which women try two years, they don't conceive, they're taken straight for an IVF because the government pays for it. And for them, it is much cheaper to do an IVF than to do IUIs. So, but in a country like ours, why is it that we hesitate before we take a woman for IVF? Because of these three things. It's invasive, it's expensive, but yes, it has a shorter time to pregnancy. You won't have diabetics. I mean, you know, diabetic uh, keeps uh, injecting herself two, three times in a day for the rest of her life. But you tell the fertility patients, you need injections for two weeks. You will not see them for two years. Just the concept of injecting themselves for just two weeks is something that they find very daunting. What about IVF or should we do ICSI for unexplained? Well, there is no difference in terms of clinical pregnancy rates or live birth rates when you're comparing conventional IVF to ICSI in these couples with unexplained. But before you take them for IVF, there are a few prerequisites that have to be fulfilled. That is, you have to assess the uterine cavity. It doesn't matter. You don't have to do a hysteroscopy. A good 3D ultrasound, SIS, is enough for you to give an impression of your uterine cavity. You have to reassess the hormonal imbalance in these people. <coughs> there are quite a few times in which people have are hypothyroid or hyperprolictinemia before we even realize and we take them for IVF. There has to be an accurate evaluation of ovarian reserve. Why ovarian reserve at this point is because your whole management and your protocol depends on an ovarian reserve. We have uh, algorithms which actually tells us what kind of medication or what is the dose of medication based on their ovarian reserve. So don't look at an ovarian reserve, uh, you know, investigation or a test that was done six months earlier. You have to do a current ovarian reserve assessment when you're taking them for IVF. Obviously, a sperm function test. And to date, we have certain uh, information which say that Treating a woman or an infertile couple, both man and woman with antioxidant, might improve their chances in terms of their fertilizing and the quality of the gametes. So the point is not directly go for IVF because IVF, we have to understand that you are giving the best shot. You have been given one opportunity. IVF is not something that we should keep asking them to do over and over again. The first IVF that you do for a woman has to be the best IVF. It's like laparoscopy. If you're going ahead with laparoscopy, you have to come out completing the procedure. So when you are going for an IVF, your first concept has to be, how do I improve the oocyte quality? How do I improve the sperm quality? What do I have to anticipate so that I can give her the best outcome in the first cycle itself? What do we do when it comes to the oocyte or the sperm? All that we have left now is you know, lifestyle management, the things that we spoke about earlier, and putting them on antioxidants. Should we anticipate failed fertilization? You know, in unexplained, probably it is slightly higher than a normal couple, but then it still doesn't say that you have to directly go for ICSI, but that has to be kept in mind. 
Why is IVF4XC diagnostic and therapeutic? Because we have said there are quite a few unknowns when we are looking at IUI. How does IVF help us? Well, it helps you assess the oocyte, the sperm, and the embryos, which we weren't able to do in IUI. It overcomes the cervical factor abnormality. It also interact, interaction defects between the sperm and egg is counteracted. And the sperm and egg transport defects, when we were talking about the tubal motility, everything is actually taken care of in IVF. And for fertilization failure, we have the treatment of ICSI. And we can also detect the cleavage abnormalities of embryos. But even if we tell a couple, you know, IUI didn't work, go for IVF. The next question is, okay, then I'm guaranteed to go home with the baby. Your answer is still no. So even though IVF is doing all of this for you, what is it that IVF is not helping you with? And that is implantation. Even if you are optimizing the oocyte, the sperm, you're helping the fertilization, you're ensuring that you're giving them the best incubator uh, for them to grow in, develop in, you get a blastocyst, you put it back in, are you ensure it? Are you absolutely sure that the woman will conceive? The answer is still no. So what do you do when you have a woman who's 33 years of age or less than that with a good reserve and a normal semen analysis? Now, this one actually defines unexplained. So here we have taken the age. We have ensured that she has a good reserve. We have ensured that they have a normal semen uh, parameters. Then we will go for timed intercourse. If she still hasn't conceived, then we'll do a tubal assessment and then go for an IUI. IUI for a young woman, we can go up to three to six cycles, but after two cycles of failed IUI provided, you have ensured that she's got at least two follicles ovulation and the total motile sperm count is good and at least one patent tube is there and you haven't managed to get her pregnant after two cycles, that's when laparoscopy can be considered. So that why laparoscopy can be considered for two reasons. Two reasons being you will treat mild endometriosis and you'll also look for any kind of adhesions, which could be a reason for the, again, the sperm not to mate. If you have done IUI between three to six cycles and she still hasn't conceived, that's when we'll be looking at IVF ICSI. So if you look, even if a woman is young and the sperm count is good, the reserve is good, if she hasn't conceived in approximately six to nine months, before a year, she has to go towards IVF. What about IVF ICSI? Like we said, it's not guaranteed. It's not 100%. So what is the next step of IVF uh, ICSI? Well, what we have to know is if you put back four blastocysts, and I'm not talking about four blastocysts all at once, that would be an absolute crime. What I'm saying is four blastocysts at different attempts. If you're going for a single embryo, go for single embryo at least twice. If she still hasn't conceived with single embryo, then you go for a double embryo transfer. So together, cumulatively, you have transferred four embryos, four blastoses at different attempts. And if she still hasn't conceived, that is when we call them recurrent implantation failures. And what we then have to look at is the final thing that fertility treatments at this point we are able to offer is genetic screening with endometrial receptivity assay. Should we go through this algorithm, the chances of a woman going home with a baby, and I'm not talking about clinical pregnancy, I'm not talking about just seeing two lines on a strip, a woman going home with a baby, the chances are approximately 60 to 70%. Again, even with the best advancements in fertility practice as of now, as you can see, we still haven't reached the 100% mark. What if you have a woman who's much older, who's got a borderline or a poor ovarian reserve, or who's got borderline or poor sperm parameters, well, again, if they've had absolutely no prior treatments and the duration of infertility is less, please don't forget about the duration of infertility also. So if the duration of infertility is less, but there are certain concerns when we are talking about the sperm or the ovarian reserve, please limit the number of IUIs to just two to three. If she doesn't conceive, that's when we'll go towards IVF. But if they've had earlier fertility treatments, this couple who we are looking at a borderline or a, or a poor reserve with either sperm or oocyte, if they've had earlier fertility treatments, you will not continue with further cycles of IUI. You'll go directly for IVF. And again, like we said, they've gone for IVF, but they still haven't conceived after cumulative uh, for blastocyst transfers, 
then it is PGTA or ERA. Just to give you a bit of an extension of what we spoke, there are some sometimes when we are talking about blastosis transfers, we are talking about good grade blastosis transfers. What happens when a woman has gone through IVF, but you're not able to generate good quality blastocyst? What do you do then? We reassess your protocols. We reassess the uh, you know medications that the woman has been taking. We will see whether there's some kind of pretreatment that can be given to both the couples so that we can improve the oocyte or the sperm quality. We check for the DNA fragmentation index. Then rearrange the protocol such that we have evaluated and addressed each of these factors. And that's when you go for another IVF. That's why I said your first IVF cycle has to be the best. If you have given your best, but you still are not able to produce good quality blastocyst, the first thing you have to question is the lab. You're confident the lab has done its job. That's when you have to rework and see how best you can improve these four parameters before you go for a second IVF. It should not be, okay, first IVF failed, you know, 40% only conceived, 60% failed, so let's do another one. That's not the attitude. The attitude has to be, even if I'm going for a second IVF cycle, which probably she might need, what is it that I'm going to do different? How am I going to give her a different outcome than the first? So summary, minimum number of IUIs, when we really looked at the chances of pregnancy, we found that up till three, you have an escalating chance of a good chance of a pregnancy. Maximum number of IUI, again, we have certain caveats. If the ovarian reserve is optimal and she's a young woman, you can go up to six. But if the reserve is average or the woman is slightly older, limit yourself to three IUIs. If below average reserve or the woman is above 35, then IVF may be better. But if she's had no treatments, getting the couple to say directly go for IVF is not something that even you would agree on or you would feel convinced before you say IVF. So in those couples, possibly without wasting time, let's go for two IUIs. But if she does, doesn't conceive, go for IVF. If the poor is reserve is poor and the woman is above 35, probably the best chance would be IVF ICSI. So when we are talking about ovarian reserve, since we have stressed so much on the ovarian reserve, what about the ovarian reserve and how would you interpret it? Scan for an AFC. If it's more than 20, she can go up to six cycles. If the AFC is between 15 to 20, four cycles. If it's lesser than 15, probably stick to just three cycles. If it's anything less than 10 AFC, which means five on each side, you probably have to go beyond IUI and look at IVF. Because if you do IVF in a woman who has less ovarian reserve, IVF is not going to do wonders for you. IVF will only do as much as you give it. You give good oocytes, you give good number of oocytes, you can give her a good pregnancy rates. If you exhaust all her oocytes at IUI, by the time she goes for IVF, if she's left with less than 10 AFCs, <coughs> even an IVF might not be of help to her. She's spending all that amount of money, but you're not able to give her the same amount of success rate that another person would if you gave them good number of oocytes. So that is why when you're considering IVF, you have to consider IVF at a time that you can at least give her a 40 to a 45% chance of success. And that comes only if you're able to produce between 8 to 12 oocytes. You're able to produce 8 to 12 oocytes, which the embryologist says is mature. So how will you do it unless you have that number of AFCs? So that's the reason if you have an AFC which is going less than 10, it's better to go for IVF. <coughs> when should IVF be considered soon? And that is without delay. When she's older, when your AMH is less than 2, AFC, like we said, is less than 10. FSH is creeping up. It has crossed to 9. Severe endometriosis. Like I said, severe endometriosis, whatever you do, the best chance of pregnancy is with IVF. <clears throat> Adenomyosis and fluctuating sperms. So this is when we would say that probably IUI is not the treatment, but to go for IVF. But if we are considering IUI, like I said, we have to make sure that we are giving them the best chance with whatever treatment you're doing. <clears throat> this one paper actually summed it out very carefully, and they said that there was a decline in ovarian reserve, maybe an undiagnosed reason for unexplained infertility. So when a woman comes back and say, everything is fine with me, and you do ovarian reserve tests, and you realize that she has got 
uh, borderline or a reduced reserve, that itself could be a reason for her unexplained infertility. <clears throat> to answer this perennial question, should it be IUI or IVF for unexplained infertility, there's a trial that is being run, and this has been there since 2019. <clears throat> And here they are doing a randomized control trial, which is called the FIX study, to see whether it is in, uh, insemination or IVF, which would be the best answer for unexplained infertility. Hopefully this will answer the question that we are debating today. Thank you. Thank you for such an informative session, ma'am. Now is the time for a panel discussion on some of the challenging case scenarios we encounter in a daily practice. I would like to request our respected panelists to kindly come up on stage. Dr. Durga, ma'am. Dr. Krishna Chaitanya, scientific head at OSS Fertility. Dr. Purnima Jaydev, senior specialist at Sir C.V. Raman General Hospital. And Dr. Meghna, clinical head at Fertility, OSS Fertility HSR. The session will be moderated by Dr. Rajeshwari, Clinical Head and Fertility Specialist, OSS Banshankri. Dr. Durga ma'am, Dr. Krishna Sritanya sir, Dr. Purnima Jayadev, and Dr. Meghna Nayapati. Over to you ma'am, Rajeshri ma'am. Good evening everybody, thank you Prinka. And good evening all the panelists. Today we are going to discuss few interesting cases and uh, we'll try to finish it as quickly as possible because I know it's late already. Uh, this was a case, couple with 34 and 36 year old, married for eight years with primary infertility. Women had irregular periods, that is 30 to 90 days, and she was on hypothyroid on medication since many years. She has, in the past history, she had undergone a hysterolab in 2016. Hysteroscopy showed normal cavity, and in laparoscopy, uterus and tubes were normal. Bilateral patency was proved, and she had an ovarian drilling. And the uh, past investigation, which was done in 2018, her AMH was 8.6, FSH was 4.88, LH was 3.26, and a normal female karyotype. And the male partner was 36-year-old, a government employee with no significant surgical or medical history. His seven parameters, which was done in 2017, was within normal limits, and karyotype was a normal male pattern. And the previous treatment history, she has undergone ovulation induction and IUI four times, which has failed. And one cycle of IUI was done in 2018. Antac protocol was used. She got 18 oocytes, and no reports were available. She said, the couple said that oocyte and the sperm quality was good. And all 18 were mature, 18 also fertilized and cleaved. But on day three, they had seven embryo, 11 embryos which were of grade C and which were discarded and they did not have any embryos for transfer. So now I would like to ask Gova back for the uh, brief history what she has had. How many of you here, audience would uh, agree that lap ovarian drilling to be done? Ma'am, what, what do you say? What is the role of lap ovarian drilling? Uh, 
uh, there are uh, different thoughts like uh, whether it is helpful or not but still lap ovarian drilling will be giving 60% of pregnancy within 6 months after the uh, ovarian lop but uh, uh, the thing is uh, when we do uh, lap ovarian drilling it should be not more than uh, 4 to 10 maximum should be 4 to 10 uh, punctures and it will definitely it depends on the amh also it should be very high when we do lab drilling and when the normal medical line of treatment has failed, then we will do lab as madam told. It should be like a treatment part also when we do lab, not only diagnostic, it should be therapeutic. At that time, lab ovarian drilling will definitely be helpful. Uh, usually lap ovarian drilling is considered when they have medical treatment as she told uh, CC resistance and uh, they do not want to take gondotrophins or they are staying far off and they cannot come for monitoring. These are the kind of people whom we can offer lap ovarian drilling. And also, if they are undergoing laparoscopy for any other problems, that time we can offer them lap ovarian drilling. But we should take keep it in mind that because we not only have gynecologists here, we have other people as well or in the audience, I would like to say, it should not be more than four punctures on each ovary for four seconds and 40 watts. That's something which we have to keep in mind. Dr. Meghna, uh, subclinical hypothyroid, what is the impact on the fertility? Because she's known hypothyroid since many years. So what would be the impact on the fertility? Certainly in this case, since she's a known hypothyroid, she's already on medication. But in case we have a case of subclinical hypothyroidism, then it is prudent to treat her for the subclinical hypothyroidism because we have seen that it can have an effect from the stage of follicular genesis to the neurocognitive development in the developing fetus. True. So according to the ASRM criteria and also according to the American Thyroid Society, uh, treating subclinical hypothyroidism has benefit in the fertility aspect. Yes, thank you. Do PCOS have all the time in the world because their AMH is on the higher side? is more the better. Durga ma'am, what is your thoughts on this? Definitely more is better, but it doesn't mean that they have all the time in the world. In fact, yes, we know that PCO women, their uh, menopause is also slightly delayed and you know they still have estrogen in the system for much longer than what another woman who does not have PCO uh, have. But when we are talking about you know, treatment, obviously she's an ovulatory, so we are giving her ovulatory dr drugs. And as of now, the recommendation is even if you're giving Clomid, you should not be going beyond a year. So how many times and how much of a treatment can you give a woman just because she's young or she has a good number of follicles? So again, I think even in this respect, even if she has a good AMH, the dictum still remains the same. If you have done six cycles of timed uh, you know, ovulation induction in these women with timed intercourse, following it up with another four to six cycles of IUI. If they haven't conceived it within a year, I think it's prudent to go to IVF because you really don't want to keep giving them medications and then them landing up in borderline ovarian tumors, which is a known risk as we know. Yes, thank you. The course in the OSS investigation, when she came to us in March, FSH was 5.57, LH was 8.46, AMH was 5.14, TSH was 8.72, prolactin was with a normal limit, and our AFCs were 8 to 10 on either sides. And she was treated for the thyroid, and the male partner was asked to do semen analysis. Since he was from out of Bangalore, he wanted to do it outside, and we insisted that do it in one of the IVF labs. Uh, so he had got a CASA. In the, according to CASA, the count was 97.5 million per ml. Motility was 44.1. 19% progressive, 6% normal forms. And when we asked him to get a DFI done because of the previous experience, what they had got, it was 48%. So going back to the CASA, I would like to ask Krishna, sir, what would he comment on the CASA? Um, well, no, automation is what we are wanting in the field of ART, you think? We're all talking about artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, CASA is a right move, but I think it's too early to say that it's going to replace a manual assessment because there are quite a few pitfalls with CASA. Uh, the uh, idea behind it is wonderful, uh, 
uh, but it's operative dependent. It's not as automated as we probably do a, a CBP where, you know, you just put the blood and you're getting an automated hemogram printed. Uh, that's not how a CASA works. You, know, you have to manually load it uh, and do a little manual assessment and then see whether you're going to accept it or not. And a lot of uh, round cells and debris uh, can sometimes give a, a false result. And then we've seen that the error rates are quite high. Uh, so I think uh, the idea is nice, but I think yet to be standardized. So will uh, should we be uh, you know, referring everybody for a CASA and not a manual assessment? Uh, I think there's very less evidence to say that. Thank you, sir. That's what, as sir told, we still need manpower for uh, the initial assessment. And all the round forms and, uh, and round cells and the dead sperm also can be counted and get a false or error can be there. That is what we found in our case as well when we went forward for an IVF. What is the effect of high DFI in uh, infertility? Dr. Meghna? Uh, there are a lot of case times when we have done a normal semen analysis and found that everything is fine, but still the patient has not conceived, which could one of the be the cases in this patient also, because during the previous IVF cycle also, probably high DFI could be one of the reason for uh, low quality embryos. So uh, the DFI, there are various reasons why the DFI is on the higher side. And many times when a semen analysis is done and we see that the normal forms are on the lower side, we have to think that probably this is a couple where DFI could be on the higher side and we need to check for that. And uh, DFI, probably, yes, it might not give us very low quality embryos, but it does have an effect by giving biochemical pregnancies or early pregnancy losses are one of the effects what we see in a couple where the male partner has high DFI. Uh, high DFI, when do you consider when you have a, uh, when the age is high, smoker, or he's taking certain medication, chemotherapy, all these cases, we should consider unexplained infertility when it has not happened as ma'am told. DFI should be considered to do. And just to add on there, uh, you know, yes, there's a lot of evidence to say that if your DNA is fragmented, it can affect the reproductive outcomes. But what we also need to understand is, uh, we cannot routinely do a DFI with every semen analysis. You know, uh, we do see a lot of times that the first time the man's gone to get a semen analysis and over enthusiastically we've got a DNA fragmentation test done. Uh, there are quite a bit, um, you know, negative or pitfalls about this test, how we interpret and how we manage. Uh, yes, there is a role for specific indications. But will every couple walking to the ART clinics, should we be offering a DNA testing? The answer is no. I think we really need to be very careful whom we offer because I think it's still experimental. There isn't a consensus to say that everything is around the DNA fragmentation index. Yes, so sir. And the cost also is very high and the patient will run away from you if and you go on asking for everybody. You know, your next question, how do we uh, go about managing a high DFI? We uh, honestly do not have... Uh, the right answer at this point in time. I think that we broadly categorize them into either treat the man or treat the sperm. You know, that's the broad two categories. So treating the man, you look for the underlying cause, you know, uncontrolled diabetes, lifestyle factors, chronic smoking, alcohol, or obesity. Um, uh, varicocele, which is, um, you know, clinically palpable. You know, uh, these are the few things which we say are underlying causes, which are increasing the oxidative stress and thereby DNA fragmentation. So it's always worthwhile to uh, take a proper history and involve the man also, uh, rather than just taking the semen sample. So that's one way of handling the man when there's raised DNA fragmentation. The other thing that people have uh, tried and experimented uh, is to do a testicular sperm aspiration. All of us have learned in our uh, medical school days that when there's azospermia, we do a testicular sperm aspiration, surgically. Uh, surgically retrieved testicular sperm, but this is another newer indication that researchers have been trying. You're going to the testers and you're, you're directly uh, retrieving the sperms. You're not letting the sperm undergo the whole uh, side effects of oxidative stress. So that's shown to be beneficial, but is it really going to impact the outcomes? That's still uh, debatable because uh, we still yet to define which group would benefit 
So these are the options what you could do with the man and a simple thing of frequent ejaculation. You know, uh, be it the stress or work, I think uh, intercourse is getting, uh, is not as frequent as it's expected to, at least in couples who are planning to fall pregnant. We say every alternate day, uh, regular act of intercourse is a healthy practice. Uh, but um, not ejaculating can be one of the reasons why DFI is going up. So frequent ejaculation is a simple therapy of handling the DFI. Well, on the other side, handle the sperm. You know, in this even sample, what you've got, how do we separate the best quality sperms with uh, normal DNA? And then there are, again, quite a few newer techniques like microfluidics, magnetic cell separation, but we still don't know the answer as to which one is efficient over the other. Thank you. And uh, uh, the course in OSS, uh, we did uh, correct her thyroid and then we gave her metformin and since she had a poor uh, outcome in the previous uh, cycle, we gave, pre-treated her with the coenzyme Q, vitamin D3 uh, for about uh, six weeks. And ANTAC protocol was used. And we started the stimulation. And we got, again, 18 oocytes. Out of that, 17 were... Seven, sorry for... We used microfluidics uh, for the uh, sperm preparation, and uh, we got 32 million per ml, 90% rapid motility, 10% was slow, and only 1% was normal form. In the car side, was showing as 6%, and our uh, embryologist had a tough time finding seven normal sperm for the ICSI procedure. Husband also was given antioxidants and uh, advised frequent ejaculation. And this, I just wanted to show a video of. Uh, the microfluidics. So this is a newer method. So what you do is you just, it's a microfluidic chip, which basically works on those micro channels. So the sperm with good DNA integrity are going to be separated through different channels. So you add it through those and the ones which are good uh, gets channelized and reach a particular well, and you just take it. It's very simple. It's easy to use. Um, you're not adding any additives here. Uh, so far, it looks safe, and I think we've had an encouraging result, and we've got a couple of publications on the role of microfluidics. It's, it works well, but I think much more data is still awaited to uh, accept it as a routine clinical process, but that was microfluidics. And uh, uh, we got 18 oocytes, and uh, 17 were M2. ICSI was done. And the oocyte quality, that was dark oocytes with large perivitaline space and debris. And uh, 15 fertilized. On day three, we had 14 embryos, which were grade three, and one was of grade one. So we froze because of the previous experience. Two embryos were frozen on day three. That is one six cell grade two, one eight cell grade three. And all others were taken for day five. All other embryos were taken cultured, and we got one blast. 3AB, grade 3, which is frozen, and she's ongoing fit cycle. Ma'am, I would like to ask, what could we have done differently? I don't think we could have done anything differently, but uh, looking at the kind of embryos that have been developed, even though we have used microfluidics and taken care of the DNA fragmentation, which was high in the man, I think the only option left is for us to try IVM. Now, IVM is a concept, particularly for somebody with PCO ovaries, who with gonadotropins or any kind of stimulation are consistently giving us poor quality oocytes. Then one option is to do IVM for them wherein we will go directly into the follicles when they are less than 10 millimeters. So we don't give any kind of stimulation that takes the follicles beyond 10 millimeters. And we go and uh, aspirate the immature oocytes, mature them in vitro. And we are currently doing a study with uh, Brussels University in which we are doing CAPA IVM. And with this, the uh, quality of the embryos could be much better than what you're getting at IVF. So that would be one option because, frankly, all the interventions have been tried. You have given her metformin. You have taken care of her hyperandrogenism. You know, you're reducing her insulin resistance. You have given her coenzyme Q10, corrected vitamin D, corrected her thyroid. 
Antagonist is only the protocol for her. We can't go for any other protocol. And you have given her, you know, recombinant, and she's given a good uh, estrogen numbers. level. It was six thousand yeah, or 6, 000, so, yes. and you had good numbers. So, either a minimal stimulation, whether that would work, or IVM. I think these are the only two options left for her. So, was there a role of TISA for her? I mean, for the couple. Um, well, you know, that's that's the whole question right now. You know, individually, TISA, yes, has given encouraging results. Microfluidics also has given encouraging results. But is one intervention efficient over the other uh, is yet to be proven. And we are undertaking a, um, a RCT at Oasis where we're randomizing the men with TISA, max, microfluidics, and daily ejaculation. Uh, and we're yet to see what the uh, outcome at the end of the study would be. Uh, since you've already, you know, there has to be a way of handling the sperm's DNA, and we've done microfluidics. So I don't think we have deprived the patient of uh, uh, an ideal or an optimal management there. And the daily ejaculation also was... Uh, this is a part of it. So uh, it, it's all about, you know, when we have had a failed cycle and we're going to the next, uh, we have to ensure that we've given them some kind of intervention where we've got the best gamete quality, and microfluidics is a decent way of doing it. So we've done our best there. Thank you, sir. So to take home message from this case is, it is not the quantity, but it is the quality that matters. Be cautious before offering lap ovarian drilling. Consider checking DFI in case of unexplained infertility, recurrent implantation failure, recurrent pregnancy loss, smokers, male parameters to be monitored more closely. We're going to the second case. Um, this was a couple who was um, married for seven years. The lady was 33 years and she had a regular cycles, known hypothyroid, was on medication. And uh, she had a first pregnancy which was spontaneous six years back. She had uh, twins, male and a female. So male child was with her and the female she had given for adoption to her brother. And the male child which was with her, Due to some infection or something, she ha baby had fever and died two years at the age of two years. She had undergone lap sterilization soon after the delivery, and she underwent recanalization as well four years after the four years back. And when HSG was done, both the tubes were not patent or there was no patency post surgery. Investigations, which was done in November 2021. FSH was 9.22, LH was 5.5, thyroid was 0.6 normal limit, prolactin was normal. And male partner, he was a 37-year-old severe oats with varicocele. Spelling mistakes, excuse me. And seven analysis showed that had shown 1 million sperm per ml, 1% progressive motility, 1% normal form, male, normal male karyotype. And uh, Ultrasound scrotum was done, which showed the testis, right testis, 2.8 into 0.9 into 1.8 centimeters. Left was 2.5 into 1.1 into 1.3. And the right epididymal, uh, that's fine, bilateral varicocele was there. On the right side, it was grade 2. Left side, it was grade 3. And outside, he was advised by the andrologist to undergo the ligation. And they had undergone one IVF cycle in January 2022. It was a long, we did, did not have a proper uh, report with her. Could be a long protocol was what we assumed from the prescription she had. And she had a FET in Jan, uh, February, Jan uh, 2022. It was a straight HRT, three eight cell grade A embryostose transferred. And it was a biochemical pregnancy. Now, the question is immediate postpartum tubal sterilization. Ma'am, what is your thought? Uh, as per government of India, we cannot do uh, postpartum tubal sterilization until unless the mother is having one year old child. So only with one child, we cannot do the postpartum sterilization the next day until unless they have their, uh, uh, with the first, uh, uh, this one, uh, first marriage, they have already had a baby then they are going for a second, then we will consider. Otherwise, with the only, well, yesterday she has delivered to, uh, after 36 hours only, we do the tubal sterilization, but we cannot do, if the baby is not one year old, we cannot do postpartum sterilization. 
and uh, many of the couple are requesting which we see from government hospital they have undergone uh, sterilization immediate post op uh, post operative period that is one thing which we all have to learn that we have to tell at least one year the baby has to be for one year even if it is a second child to postpone sterilization for whatever reason they may change the mind or something may happen to the baby so wait till one year is what we have to advise then tubal recanalization or ivf dr megna what would you say when the couple come back to you they plan for another child or they change their mind or something has happened to the baby and they want to have one more baby when we are talking about this case particularly in the uh, investigations her fsh is already 9 so we don't have her amh and we also know that she has had a failed ivf cycle but in case we talk about tubal recanalization versus ivf uh, the whole point of doing tubal sterilization i mean sterilization is that they don't conceive again so the gynecologist who would have been doing would have made sure that a good am amount of the length of the tube has been cut so that she doesn't conceive again so that is one major factor which we find difficult when we are planning to do tubal sterilization because we need at least a length of 4 cm post tubal recanalization to have some chances of a pregnancy along with that post tubal recanalization chances of ectopic pregnancies are on the higher side and if we come to this uh, particular couple the chance of pregnancy with his semen analysis of 1 million per ml are almost uh, i mean they are very less so if you talk about this particular couple ivf is the best option but even otherwise unless we go into i mean we go into the surgery at the time of surgery it is very difficult to tell any couple that certainly your tubal recanalization is going to be effective and post tubal recanalization the couple should have enough time to try for pregnancy at least a years time to be given for them to try for pregnancy so if all these criteria are met then probably tubal recanalization can be done in a young couple where the male and female parameters are found to be normal thank you first thing when a couple come to us we have to one more thing uh -huh. uh, when we do postpartum tubal uh, actually when we do lap sterilizations that is done after 45 days and that have better results when we do recanalization because very small part of the tube is uh, damaged there so recanalization is having better results more than 50% if done uh, through lap lap also so the method is, rather also than, yeah method of how you do recanalization role. also and one advice for all the government uh, doctors where like all other doctors also whenever they do uh, re this one sterilization let them do at the isthmus part because we'll always in a rush sometime doing many cases of uh, sterilization at a time in a camp we do around 30 40 cases so at that time at least we should keep this in mind maybe any time they may need recanalization so do it at the isthmus part so the recanalization will be good results are good pregnancy will be good so when a couple come asking for recanalization first thing is both of them should be evaluated whether it is worth doing that it's a major surgery so whether it is worth doing what will be their chance of pregnancy should be assessed so both amh a basal uh, scan to see for afcs amh for her and a semen analysis for the man and one more thing what you need to know is which method has been done what is the duration and we need to know before opening up we need to know what is the length of the tube available whether anastomosis can be done between the two ends so what is the role of varicocele repair in the present case well you've decided to give all the controversial questions to me uh, well i Uh, you know should you offer varicose repair i think the answer is yes and no i think uh, it, it'll be better to discuss uh, with the positive time you know where we should not be offering a varicose you know uh, as per the european uh, guidelines or the american guidelines if there is no um, you know uh, altered semen parameters two semen analysis done at two different locations if they have not shown Uh, or if there's normal count and motility, just doing a varicocele because we've picked up on a routine evaluation. The answer is no. If there is a, a known female factor where IVF is inevitable, in this case where I think the tubes were still not patent, so the option was only IVF. So doing a varicocele might not have improved the uh, uh, the outcome. outcome. Uh, isolated teratozoospermia. You know, there's so many times where we rush and do a varicocele repair again that. 
might not be uh, the ideal situation. Uh, these things to be kept in the mind. Uh, again, you will have to go case by case as to what the couple needs in the other indications. Uh, but one thing that needs to be discussed and counseled is recurrence is there. Uh, you know, the sperm parameters might not become normal in all cases. Uh, it is a kind of jackpot that you're correcting and uh, no guarantees can be given. And uh, backup uh, semen freezing is something that we encourage all the men undergoing varicoceles at our center. So uh, with these things, I think we could go ahead. And then the other thing, this man had a very low sperm parameters. So I would be interested to look at his um, testicular function. If there's already profound primary testicular failure where FSH is very high, um, correcting a varicocele again might not improve the sperm parameters. As an ART practitioner, for me, you know, post varicocelectomy, am I improving the sperm parameters, which is helping them conceive, uh, if not naturally, at least with the TI or an IUI. At the end, if I'm again doing an ICSI cycle, uh, I've not really done uh, uh, a smart thing and I've not saved his resources. I've not increased the outcome. Will DFI again, is, uh, when I put into it, I think there's a lot of controversy around it. We'll hold on for now. So those are the few ways that I would want to approach the varicose Sir, I have indication. two questions for you. What are the parameters which may improve? What to expect if at all we do varicose? Leave alone this case. Count and motility and the DFI. Three things that are uh, shown to improve. Uh, and, and of course, the pregnancy outcome. I think what's ultimately important for the patient uh, is, you know, uh, what is the chance of uh, falling pregnant? Um, and uh, even till today, uh, there isn't a consensus which can give us some kind of a figure saying that, you know, there'll be a 30, 60, 80 percent improvement. So you, you will have to individualize. You'll have to counsel and help the patient understand, give them the options and let the patient make the decision. And then let's not, we shouldn't be the people forcing on a varicose repair for them. And one more thing, many of them may be having in the audience that doubt. Um, at what count will you say, no, I do, we cannot do a DFI for this? All right. Anything less than 5 million uh, sperm count doing a DNA assessment. It's not that we can't do it. The assessment can go wrong. You know, of, of the different methods available for testing, which is the tunnel assay and the comet or a sperm chromatin structural assay. Um, you know, you are going to, you will have to count at least 5,000 cells for you to have a sensitivity and specificity that's acceptable. So in, when the counts are going uh, less than 5 million, you might not have 5,000 cells available for counting. So that is where the error rates could go down. So anything less than 5 million, we would not want to send for a DFI testing. Since you are the only andrologist here, nobody is going to rescue you, sir. Next two questions are for you only. <laughs> What is the cutoff uh, sperm parameters you when you will say, okay, fine, I can do it. Ma'am has already told that, yeah. but I would uh, want you to say it again. Parameters well, uh, for, IUI for an IUI, IUI, you know, provided the female parameters uh, are absolutely fine. And only from a male perspective, we want to take a call. You know, uh, we call it as total motile sperm count. So you will have to do a sperm preparation and see what the final pellet you've got. And if that has got uh, cells which are totally motile, 10 million and above, that's probably where the success is plateauing. Uh, anything less might have little issues. There are anecdotal reports which have said a 5 million TMSE or a 1 million TMSE can give. But by and large, I think 10 million TMSE is accepted for an IUI. For an IVF, a 1 million TMSE is acceptable. And the role uh, of uh, co-treatment -treatment. Co of male. Well, again, um, you know, the Cochrane review, the last published, uh, also says that, you know, it is not going to improve uh, the take-home uh, baby rates, but the level of evidence is low to very low. But uh, the sperm parameters do improve to a certain extent. Clinical like, uh, pregnancies have shown to be improved by certain papers. But take-home baby is not uh, uh, increased. But considering the lifestyle that's so erratic and so many issues and challenges, um, giving an antioxidant is something that uh, would be beneficial if not harmful. Uh, only few things to be kept in mind. Uh, please look at the combination of uh, antioxidants that you've got. You know, having hundreds of them will not work. 
lycopene, L-carnitine, CoQ, zinc, selenium. Five of them, we really don't know the clinical dosage, a maximum of three months. Putting them for antioxidants for one or two years is not going to do any benefit. If you've tried them for three months, if your count and motility has not improved, provided the patient is with you for three months, uh, I think you've done the job and you need to move on. You know, it's time to look at the next step, are you or IVF? So varicocele repair should be taken very cautiously. If the person is having any other uh, problem like pain or something, for that you can do. But pro if his count is on the lower side, freeze one per sample, go ahead with fertility treatment, then you can go for correction. And cutoff parameters, total for sperm, motile sperm count for an IUI should be about 10 million. And for an IVF, 1 million. And the potential for antioxidants, yes, you can try whatever benefit it can. The Cochrane says take home live birth rate doesn't improve. And this is one of the, just to show the what was the WHO 2010 and 2020 parameters, differences. And when we investigated the lady, her AMH was 0 0.59. Her AFCs on the right side, one side was 3, another side 2 to 3. Durga, ma'am. Young women with low reserves. Your comment, ma'am. I mean, this is something that uh, we are seeing more and more. The incidence is rising. And frankly, we don't have an answer to give them either because none of these women actually have had either chemotherapy or radiotherapy or any kind of iatrogenic reason for low reserve. But this is something that we are tending to see very often. The only thing is we are not currently doing any genetic studies, but probably this is one group in which we could attribute some of their reason for low reserve being a genetic uh, predominance, whether it is, you know, uh, the fragile egg syndrome or, you know, whether there are any issues with the receptor study. So this is one area in which probably genetics will come into the picture. The second thing is obviously lifestyle. We really don't know what we are eating and what we are drinking, what kind of you know, pesticides we are consuming, what kind of organophosphorus uh, you know, chemicals are being uh, given into the uh, fruits, vegetables, what we are consuming. The amount of plastics that have invaded into our uh, drinking water <laughs> right in front of us. So there are so many reasons why probably we can attribute low reserve to. But none of these are something that we can actually assess, diagnose, and treat. The only thing is advice has to be given to any couple who is trying. You know, it, they don't have to reach to a fertility specialist before we give them the advice. I think it's all over. We really know what are the kind of... In fact, there's a list of uh, vegetables, you know, that I read wherein it's unlikely to have any pesticides uh, smeared on them. There are certain fruits also in which, you know, it's unlikely, like a watermelon. I don't think people really spray a lot of things on it. So there are certain fruits and vegetables. If you can't buy organic, which obviously is, a, a, you know, finance uh, concern also, then you have to really look at how do you get, you know, fruits and vegetables which are not uh, sprayed. And please avoid um, plastics. And we know that dioxin and plastic causes endometriosis and other concerns. So I think the, the only thing that these, uh, a couple who's trying should be told is the man has to be told about all the lifestyle interventions that are required for him. No laptops on your lap, put it on a table, you know, undergarments, hot showers, things like that. Smoking, obviously, weight. Uh, there are so many things that have to be corrected from that end. I think so that advice has to be given to the couple because once they reach this concept of, you know, being diagnosed with low reserve, unfortunately, there's very little that we can do for them. Right now, even improving their ovarian reserve, let it be with PRP or stem cells, is still experimental. We still haven't managed to give them a cure yet. But this is something that we are seeing increasingly. And it's becoming a common scenario in our clinics very much. now. And I think your the first, uh, you know, case that you had brought out, which was a PCO woman having ovarian drilling, there are quite a few, a, a, a fraction of these people with low reserve are people who have been diagnosed yes. with a PCO in the past Drilling and who have that. had, you know, rampant ovarian drilling without the concept that Madam was talking about and end up coming into this, uh, you know, quarter of uh, having low reserve. So that's also something which is iatrogenic, which we should obviously avoid. Dr. Meghna, medication for and low ovarian reserve. As uh, Madam rightly said, there is not much we can do, but to whatever extent we can try to improve the quality of those remaining oocytes is what 
we are trying with all these medications, be it our CoQ or be it our DHEA, testosterone, or even vitamin D, which has been found to improve uh, the quality of the oocytes. All these are just to make sure that the quality is maintained or rather we reduce the depletion of the available oocytes. So the options which we have are antioxidants in the form of CoQ, which we give it approximately 600 milligrams per day. DHEA, around 75 milligrams per day. Vitamin D, mostly preferred as a daily dose because we don't want the waxing and waning of the weekly dose. And along with that, other antioxidants. These are some of the measures which can be used for low ovarian reserve. And again, PRP stem cells are all experimental and they are not into regular practice still. We are all Most born, important sorry, is for them to ask them to try and get pregnant as early as, as possible. We are all born with a set of uh, oocytes. You know, all of you know that I don't have to tell that. We only can improve the quality to an extent possible. Purnima ma'am, uh, the role of vitamin D in subfertility? Uh, now there is a lot of articles about this uh, vitamin D. Uh, Definitely, it will help in self-fertility if you give regularly. As Madam told, you should not give once in a week those what we give six, uh, or 60,000 per uh, week, they'll tell. Instead of that, every day, 2,000 uh, international units, that is better. And definitely, it will improve the fertility rate. Yes. There are a lot of uh, articles about this where we have seen fertility. So we are using it in our routine practice. It also has, uh, in both sperm parameters, also the yes. vitamin D uh, has shown the effect. Means if they are uh, low in the vitamin D levels, treating them has been shown the effect. And the course at OSS, we did uh, pre-treatment with CoQ, then vitamin D3, DHEA for a month. And testosterone gel also was given for 21 days. Husband was given antioxidants and uh, we did an IVF cycle with ANTAC protocol. We gave CC as well, along with uh, HMG, 10 day stimulation. And uh, we did an OPU, we did a trigger with beta HCG. And uh, 35 hours later, we did the OPU. Seven oocytes were expected and seven obtained. Out of the seven, six were uh, M2 mature, five fertilized, five cleaved, and we got a four day five embryos. That was uh, two were 4AB grade 2, 1 was 4BB grade 2, 1 3BB grade 2. She underwent a FET uh, cycle with LPDR HRT and two day 5 embryos were transferred with a positive uh, uh, beta HCG. And not all cases will end up happily. And this was just, we wanted to show that yes, with a low reserve also, without any gamete, uh, donor gametes, women or the men ha do have chance of fathering or mothering their own, um, what to say, biological child. So take home messages, low reserve doesn't mean only donor gametes, cautious judgment before tubal sterilization, then adjuvants may have some role in poor responders. It's already nine, going to be close to 10. We have one more case. All of you are ready to sit and hear. Can we go ahead? Shall we go ahead? Okay, we'll do it quickly. The third case was, this was a couple, 27-year-old, uh, and he was 34 years, married for one year, came to us with primary infertility. It was a case of endometriosis, and she had uh, regular cycles with dysmenorrhea. She had undergone lap, uh, hysterolap, uh, 10 months back outside, and uh, it was shown that <clears throat> uterus was retroverted, fixed, bubble adhesions were there. Right tube completely covered, adhesions on the right ovary. That basically to say that it was a grade 4 endometriosis. And there was a large left ovary, had a large chocolate cyst, 6 into 6 centimeters. Two simple cysts as well, 2 into 3 centimeters. And on CPT, right, no spill, left there was spill. Hysteroscopy showed normal cavity. And uh, lap, uh, lap, I mean uh, chocolate cyst and simple cyst excision was done. And patient was advised to try naturally for pregnancy post-surgery. The investigation showed that AMH was uh, 6.79 and uh, male uh, seven parameters was within normal limits. The question is, do all endometriotic cysts need to be operated? 
Well, currently the evidence says that not all endometriotic cysts need to be operated because irrespective of the size of the cyst, uh, it doesn't change your take-home baby rates. The only reason why we would consider excision or uh, surgical management is if the woman has uh, pain, if there is uh, any of her symptoms which are prompting relief, that's when we would consider a uh, laparoscopy. Otherwise, the only thing that excision does is uh, reduce her ovarian reserve further than what endometriosis is already doing. So in somebody who's got bilateral cysts, and who's got large endometriotic cysts, I think the, the dictum is to try and conceive as quickly as possible, whether it's, you know, they've tried one year, then I think it was very prudent and very smart of her to come after one year of trying for fertility treatments, because I think that was the right advice that was given for her. Punimam, excision or drainage, what would you think? Uh... Excision is better. Uh -huh. Excision is better if uh, she has a good reserve and recurrence will be less if she has pain. But um, if her reserve is on the lower side, drainage would be better each time. Since the endometriosis is a recurrent uh, condition, again and again she may come and we do excision. Her reserve may still keep going lower That's down. That's what we have seen in practice that people keep on doing surgeries for endometriosis. There is no point and they'll tell you uh, conceive naturally. naturally, but that is actually very wrong. One, because with endometriosis, we all know, especially like this, we will advise for IVF. So don't keep on doing surgeries on and off. Because as you said, they keep on changing the doctors. Correct. They'll go and they, they're happy that they want to conceive naturally. But in this case, we should be very prudent to tell them that with this endometriosis grade 4, you better you go for IVF directly rather than changing the doctors. Patient wants to hear what they want. Yes. They're not ready to hear yes. what you're trying to tell. Dr. Meghna, would you recommend transvaginal aspiration? If yes, when? Uh, in, a, in this particular case, transvaginal aspiration, anyway, now she doesn't come back with the cyst. So in case we get a uh, patient of grade 4 endometriosis who requires IVF and she still has an endometriotic cyst, and in case we find that that endometriotic cyst is going to come in the way of her follicular aspiration, only then it is um, required for her to go through transvaginal aspiration. Or else we can certainly do the regular stimulation, our controlled ovarian stimulation, and then go ahead with the IVF. Because transvaginal aspiration has its own pitfalls Correct. in the form of peritonitis, um, pain, I, I mean surgery. She has to go through another anesthesia procedure. So these are the pitfalls of transvaginal aspiration. So only if it is coming in the way of our follicular aspiration, we go ahead with it. Durga Mam, plan of action, post-endometriotic surgery, try naturally. Again, I think uh, we have to follow the thing, how old she is, what her ovarian reserve is, and what about the sperm parameters. If these three are suggesting, you know, if you have a young woman with still even post-surgery has a good reserve and good sperm parameters, yes, they can still try at least for six months. I mean, this is a lady who's got severe endometriosis. And if I'm not mistaken, I think her right tube also was usually... Mm -hmm you know, it's likely that it could have been blocked. So again, the time uh, that is given to them to try naturally possibly has to be, you know, dealt with looking at all of these parameters before we can suggest wait for a year. Pre and post treatment uh, medication, uh, what would you say? Frankly, it depends on what she's aiming for. Is she aiming for pain control? Is she aiming for fertility? If she's aiming for pain control, that's when medical management comes into the picture. If she's aiming for fertility, there is no role for any kind of medical management. They have to go for fertility treatments if they haven't tried, if they haven't uh, succeeded uh, with natural. Uh... And the core set OSS scan showed right side endometrioma 6.8 into 5 centimeters, left side 6.7 into 5.3 centimeters. MRI was done, confirmed. And uh, male partner, 24 year, 34 year old, uh, no uh, history of smoking, alcohol, and sperm parameters. Count was good, but motility was 1% rapid, slow was 39%, and normal forms was 2%. And we planned histrolab, chocolate cyst drainage, or removal, depending on her AMH. If her AMH is low, we said donor to consider donor A, because she had bilateral large endometriomas. If AMH was normal, Selfec and Lupride was to be given and IVF uh, post-surgery, IVF, freeze-all, then the 
do down regulation and fat transfer. Histrolab was planned and we did, and uterus was normal. Bilateral huge endometriotic cysts were there, omental additions, colon closely adherent to the left, again, basically grade four. Left partial cystectomy done, left tube, right endometrium drainage done, right tube also was normal, adhesive lysis done. And she was given lupride injection post-surgery. Three weeks later, IVF was done. And um, uh, day three, there was an endometrioma, three into two centimeters. Her AFCs were 10 to 12 on right side and on 12 on the left side. Medic stimulation was started um, with growth hormone, six units of growth hormone along with menopause was given. It was an untagged, uh, down-regulated uh, cycle. 23 oocytes was retrieved. All 23 were uh, mature. 23 fertilized. On day 3, she had 11 8-cell grade 1 embryo. Then she had 8 6-7-cell to seven cell grade 1 embryo, 2 grade 6-cell grade 1 embryo, 1 4-cell grade 4 embryo. She got on day 5 4 embryos and on day 6, 2 embryos which were frozen and we did a down-regulated cycle. 2 lupride was given and uh, we did a hysteroscopy 21st day after the second one and uh, one week later started the HRT, two day five em uh, embryos were transferred. On the day of the ET, her endometrium was 10.5 and beta HCG came positive and she had uh, on scan, single live intrauterine gestation with the cardiac activity of 173. Take home messages, not all endometriomas need surgical management. Robust post-operative plan of action to be made in moderate and severe endometriotic cysts rather than telling go home and try naturally for one year. Cystectomy to be done very with caution because AMH level to be evaluated prior to surgery. And some basic tips, just two, two more slides. Um, a couple to be investigated simultaneously for a woman on day three or day two or day three is scanned to see for AFCs, hormone analysis to be done. That is thyroid prolactin if required AMH as well. And tube and seminal parameters uh, to be taken, I mean, seven analysis to be done. If these two are normal, then a tubal evaluation to be done before going for any uh, type of treatment. Patient would come many times saying that we do not want to start with the family. We want uh, some medication to postpone our pregnancy. Of late, we are seeing uh, young women with low reserve. So it is uh, very important to do one baseline scan to look for AFC, make sure they have AMH, good reserve, and then uh, advise regarding the contraceptive pill. If it is on the low, we can always counsel them not to go ahead postponing the pregnancy for a longer time. And then fertility preservation, we should advise the patient that we should offer, there is certain uh, such type of treatment that is before chemotherapy or radiotherapy to go for uh, fertility preservation. And even in women with recurrent endometriosis, who are having a recurrent surgery uh, for recurrent endometriosis, the reserve can keep coming down. So it would be advisable or give an offer, at least give them, offer them fertility preservation before it is too late and they exhaust all their eggs. Thank you. Hopefully we gave some message and uh, you would have, uh, what to say, sorted all the clutter, what you had in your minds regarding at least few cases and it will make a difference to your treatment, I hope. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, audience, for patiently hearing at this hour of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for such an excellent and informative session. I would request Dr. Rajeshri to felicitate our panelists. As you always do, we enjoy your uh, classes where you give a lot of information to our practice. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. It was very I request uh, sir to kindly felicitate Rajeshri. Thanks for all the spot We enjoyed it.
Now I would request Dr. Durgaman to kindly felicitate our guest panelist, Dr. Purnima, with a memento. I would like to thank each one of you who have made this, uh, made it for the scientific session despite your busy schedule and also take this opportunity to thank the Hyderabad team who came well in advance uh, to make the preparation and make this scientific session a success. My heartfelt thanks to BSK team who have worked really hard to make our CME a success and also like to thank the pharma companies for their support. A special mention for of our center manager, Mrs. Deepa, BD team, our admin, Mr. Rakesh, and our pharmacy team, PRE, housekeeping, and the security is a most. Now, I request all the guests to join for the dinner. Thank you all. Having a child is one of the most cherished moments in one's life. While it comes naturally to some, it is still a distant dream to many. Over the last 10 years, OSS Fertility has been committed to helping couples realize that dream. 10 years ago, when we started OSS, we had a clear vision to build an ethical and sustainable institution that is known for its medical excellence in the field of reproductive medicine. We have been able to achieve that vision thanks to the relentless efforts of our highly committed clinical and scientific teams. The brand OSS Fertility now represents a trusted platform in fertility and IVF. Today, as one of the most respected healthcare institutions in the country, and with 10,000 plus happy families, we are at the forefront of clinical excellence and patient outcomes. We didn't want to just be an organization that was just going to give fertility services. There's a lot more, but our pride or rather the ethos of this uh, organization is based on the fact that we want to provide and we do provide the most ethical uh, practices in terms of fertility. The second thing is each couple that comes